Hi, Miss Nikki here. Welcome to chapter 14. We're going to do more of an overview for this chapter. There's a lot of technical information in the second half of chapter 14, and we're just going to point out the highlights. Major functions of the spinal cord and spinal nerves are to link information between the brain and the body. So we've seen that sensory input from the body, it's going to travel from the body to the spinal cord and then from the spinal cord to the brain. And we know that motor commands are going to be issued from the brain. They're going to travel down the brain stem and the spinal cord and then eventually make their way to the body. Remember, spinal cord is still considered central nervous system, and spinal nerve, we're now into peripheral nervous system. So as soon as that nerve exits the intervertebral foramen between two vertebrae, it's now peripheral nervous system. The second major function is going to be spinal reflexes. So we'll look at these at the very end of the chapter. It does not involve the brain. So in some cases, you're going to have sensory information traveling through the spinal cord and through a series of synapses and specific events, you're going to initiate a motor message directly from the spinal cord. So the message doesn't have to take time to go up to the brain, decide what we want to do, and then issue a motor message. So there are specific regions within the spinal cord that once they're triggered, they will initiate immediate motor action. Here we have a nice figure from your textbook showing you the divisions of the spinal cord and then where the spinal nerves will exit. So we see here we have cervical and something to notice you see C8 here. There are only seven vertebrae, right? But there are eight spinal nerves. So there's an extra spinal nerve in the cervical region. So there's a cervical section, there's a thoracic, there's a lumbar, there's a sacral. And these terms that we have to know, conus medullaris and cauda equina. So this section from cervical to thoracic to the very first lumbar, different color here, is going to actually be spinal cord. So it's a cord rope-like structure. Once we get to L1, this is where the spinal cord ends in the conus medullaris is the point. And then we're going to see spinal nerves that are kind of frayed out in this cavity. Those spinal nerves are called cauda equina or horse's tail. To me, you could also think of this as you put your hair in a ponytail. So you put your hair in a ponytail and then your hairs are kind of extending out, right? So spinal cord goes to L1 vertebrae. And you can see this is just inferior to your floating ribs. We've heard this term before, nerve. It's a bundle of axons. Remember when we talked about the central nervous system, we did mention this term tracks. That's a bundle of axons if we're in the brain. We still have connective tissue wrappings, epineurium, perineurium, endoneurium. We have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. And usually we're going to label them with the first letter designation for the region that it extends from followed by the number. So this would be thoracic uh, spinal nerve number seven. So here we're going to look at the spinal roots and the spinal nerve. We're going to talk about information, right? So if I am here, this is a spinal nerve. Let's say I'm sensory information. Sensory information is coming in through the spinal nerve, and that information is going to travel on the posterior side because eventually, where does sensory information go if we're looking at the brain? We have sensory info going to the posterior part of the brain, right? So if I'm sensory information, I'm traveling spinal nerve, then this section is called the posterior root ganglion. You might also hear people call it the dorsal root ganglion. Same, same term. So sensory information is in the spinal nerve. It's traveling through the posterior root ganglion. Then it's traveling through the posterior root. It expands to these posterior rootlets. And that information is going to end up right here, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, which is called the posterior or dorsal horn.
So basically, what are we talking about? We're talking about how do we turn peripheral nervous system, remember spinal nerve is peripheral nervous system, how do we turn that into a central nervous system message? Remember, the spinal cord here is central nervous system. So we're looking at how that information changes from peripheral nervous system to central nervous system. Now let's look at how motor information would be delivered. So remember, we have our brain, and motor commands are issued from the anterior portion of the brain, right? So if I have a motor message, it's going to come down here, and this is the ventral or anterior horn of the spinal cord. So I'm here at the ventral horn, that's a motor message. That motor message is gonna go out through the anterior rootlets, then through the anterior root, and then that message goes through the spinal nerve, and then out to the body for some sort of action to take place. So one thing that we should notice is that the spinal nerve has both sensory and motor information, so we'll call this a mixed nerve. And again, what are we trying to do? In this case, since we're looking at motor, we're talking about how do we turn motor information from the brain, from the central nervous system, how do we turn that into a spinal nerve peripheral nervous system? communication or information, right? So you do need to know these different terms and how information would travel through the spinal nerve to get to the spinal cord and then eventually make it to the brain. Let's walk through that again. If I'm a sensory message, how do I get from the body to the brain? So sensory message is gonna enter from the body, spinal nerve, uh, posterior or dorsal root ganglion, posterior root, posterior rootlets, to the spinal cord here specifically, this is my dorsal or posterior horn. Then I can go up to the brain. And remember, sensory messages are going to the posterior part of the cerebral cortex. So now let's do motor. If I'm at the brain and I want a motor message to be sent out, that motor message is going to go to the ventral or anterior horn, oops, horn of the spinal cord. Then it's going to travel through the anterior rootlets, the anterior root, and then to the spinal nerve, and then the motor message goes out to the body. So you should understand this pathway and then think about some complications that could happen. So what happens if somebody's ventral horn here is damaged? What if the ventral horn of the spinal cord is damaged? You may not be able to transmit these motor messages to a specific section of the body. Remember, these messages can travel up and down, so we could have a motor message continue out another section, but this particular section will not receive motor messages from the brain, even if the brain is sending them. We need to protect and support the spinal cord. It is important for communication between the brain and the body. So the spinal cord is protected by bone. We know the vertebrae, right? We're also gonna see spinal cord meningeal layers, just like we did with the brain. And then if you remember, the central canal is going to have cerebral spinal fluid. We talked about this in the previous chapter. I know I've mentioned this already, that the spinal nerve exits through the intervertebral foramen. I want you to see that there always is a connection between protection and communication. So we want high protection for these structures, but we have to have communication. So there's always going to be some weak point. In this case, we have our vertebrae and we have our spinal cord. And I'll draw my little gray matter if you want to see my drawing, right? So we have our spinal cord and we have our vertebrae, but we have to have a point where the spinal nerve can exit so that we can have communication with the body. So there's always kind of this give and take between um, protecting these structures, but then allowing for communication to happen as well. Here's a cross section of vertebrae in the spinal cord. It's hard to see these layers. I'll show you another image in just a second. But remember, if we were starting superficial and we're going to deep, First, we're going to have the vertebrae here, right? The bony structure. 
Then too, we're gonna have this fat pad, this epidural space. Anybody who's had a child, this might sound familiar to you. Then we're gonna have the dura mater. So the dura mater is this gray structure that wraps around all of the other structures. Then we're gonna have our arachnoid mater, and that's kind of this pinkish color here. And then we're gonna have our pia mater. Remember the pia mater is like the saran wrap. It wraps and sticks very close to the actual spinal cord. So kind of learn the structures. If you learn them from superficial to deep, it'll help. An anterior view for you, you can see they've peeled away the different meningeal layers. So here's the dura mater. It is really tough. It's elastic and lots of collagen fibers. And then we have our arachnoid mater. And then we have our pia mater that's actually touching. Real quick, a clinical view, lumbar puncture. So why is it if we're trying to collect cerebral spinal fluid, why do we attempt this procedure so low? Why do we do it below L1? Well, remember we have our conus medullaris, our spinal cord. And if you look at the other images, the spinal cord takes up a large part of that cavity inside of the vertebrae, the vertebral foramen, right? So if we go lower, say L4, we should just have the horse's tail, right? The cotoquina, the individual spinal nerves. So we have less of a chance of damaging any part of the spinal cord or having permanent lasting damage from a lumbar puncture. And again, why would we want the cerebral spinal fluid? We could test it. We could see maybe if you had um, certain types of cancer within the brain of the spinal cord, if you had some sort of bacterial infection in your brain or spinal cord, we could collect the cerebral spinal fluid and use it to make some sort of diagnosis. So I alluded to horns a little bit earlier, so we'll take a look at those in the next image. But remember there's gray matter. The gray matter is going to be unmyelinated, right? It's gonna have cell bodies and dendrites and also those glial cells. So the gray matter projects from the center of the spinal cord and we have these different areas that we label posterior, anterior, and lateral horns. Here we have the posterior horn. Then we have the anterior horn. Then we have the lateral horn. I like this image because it kind of color codes everything for you here. You can see that the posterior horn is receiving body sensory messages and we can see that there's a synapse event happening. So remember the sensory information is coming through the posterior root goes to the posterior horn, and then it's gonna go up to the brain to the posterior section so that we can receive the sensory information at our cerebral cortex. And then when the motor information is coming from the brain through the spinal cord, remember that that event happens in the anterior horn and then out the anterior root. So this middle section here, the purple and this yellow, you can see that this is visceral, that would be autonomic, right, organs. So this section is going to be dedicated to um, autonomic sensory messages, and this section is gonna be dedicated to autonomic motor messages. So it's kind of the in-between, right? So the lateral horn, it's okay to kind of think this is autonomic messages, both sensory and motor. So anything coming from um, cardiac, uh, smooth muscle, you know, any of those involuntary autonomic functions. Now we're going to look at the distribution of white matter. So just like we had gray matter and we used the word horns, this time when we're talking about white matter, the funiculus, we have a posterior, a lateral, and an anterior. Remember, white matter is going to be myelinated axons and you should be thinking about um, fast neuron transmission. If we look at this image, we can see the white matter and they've kind of color coded it for you. But I want you to pay attention to the fact that we said we have a posterior funiculus and then we have this lateral white matter area and then we have an anterior funiculus, this area here. So this should be very similar if we're talking about, excuse me, white matter. We're talking about posterior, lateral, and anterior funiculus. If we're talking about gray matter, we're talking about horn, right? But they're still the same, posterior, lateral, anterior, horn.
So we're going to look at how some of the messages can travel from the body through the spinal cord to the brain utilizing both gray matter and white matter areas. Before we look at actual pathways, I do want you to realize that we have different types of information. So we can have sensory information that's coming from the body, or we can have sensory information that's coming internally from organs. So sometimes these messages will take different pathways. This is where we're going to focus more on an overview. So you do not need to understand all of these sub uh, structures as the message is traveling from the spinal cord to the brain, but I want you to get kind of more of the big picture, right? Do we understand that there is sensory information coming into the spinal cord? So we're here at spinal nerve. If it's sensory, it's traveling on the backside, so that's posterior root. We synapse here at posterior horn of gray matter. So remember, gray matter should be slow, steady messages. Then we're going to see another neuron synapse, and that's going to carry the information in the white matter area that we just talked about. This is posterior funiculus. So remember, this is sensory, carrying sensory messages. That's going to synapse with a particular nuclei within the brainstem. Specifically here, we're looking at medulla oblongata. That's going to synapse with another nuclei. It's going to travel through the midbrain. It's going to synapse here at the thalamus. Remember, the thalamus sorts all the information as it comes through the brainstem. And then eventually, the message is delivered here at the posterior um, cerebral cortex. So just kind of an overview of how messages travel in through the spinal nerve and kind of bounce around through these nuclei within the brainstem. They get processed by the thalamus and then get sent to a specific area of the cerebral cortex. Just to see another pathway, here we have again sensory information. That sensory information is coming through the spinal nerve, traveling on the backside, the posterior root. It synapses here at the posterior horn of gray matter, but I want you to see that it crosses through the bridge or the gray commissure of the spinal cord to get over here to this white matter track area. So you can cross over and then send the message through different nuclei sections and then have that information deposited at the cerebral cortex. So it depends on what type of information will tell you what path it's going to take through the spinal cord, through the brainstem to the cerebrum. Next up, we'll look at some motor pathways, such as those that control skeletal muscle. We can see if we initiate a motor message here at the cerebral cortex, that motor message travels through the thalamus, through the brain stem, through various nuclei, and eventually is deposited here. And if you remember, that's the ventral or anterior horn of gray matter. And then that information synapses at this anterior horn and we're going to see it travel through the white matter and out the ventral root, then out the spinal nerve, where we'll have a neuromuscular junction eventually at some point. So again, big picture. Do you see that a motor message is generated at the cerebral cortex, travels through the thalamus, through parts of the brain stem, eventually synapses in the ventral horn, and then that information is going to travel through a track in white matter and then eventually come out the ventral root, merge to the spinal nerve, and then eventually out to its designated target, the skeletal muscle. Of course, it's not that simple. The spinal nerve is also going to branch or split. Kind of think of the spinal cord as your super highway. You're going to have your um, off ramps and then you're going to have your roads to your street to your house right so in this image let's try another color here we can see this is spinal nerve the spinal nerve is going to have a branch or an offshoot posterior ramus and then it's also going to have a branch or offshoot anterior ramus so this anterior is going to come around and feed the anterior of the body and the posterior obviously the posterior aspects of the body
We also have these rami that serve to communicate messages to autonomic nervous system. Remember autonomic, uh, cardiac, can't write, cardiac and smooth muscle. So we're going to talk about the sympathetic trunk ganglion in the next chapter. But basically it's just a way for autonomic messages to also travel through the spinal cord. When we're looking at spinal nerves as they exit, so let's start here with T10. So as the spinal nerve is exiting, remember we have the posterior ramus that's innervating the backside or posterior side, and then it wraps around the anterior ramus, sends messages to the anterior side of the body. So this term dermatomes is talking about the segment of the skin supplied by a single spinal nerve. The case that we were looking at is T10. So T10 dermatome. So why would we map this? Why would we want to know which areas of the body or the skin are served by which spinal nerve? Well, because this can help us localize damage. Let's say somebody has lost feeling in this section of their leg. We can trace this back to an L3 spinal nerve. Maybe they have some impingement, right? Maybe they have loss of sensation. This also leads us to something called referred visceral pain. So remember when we talk about the spinal nerve and the spinal nerve feeds into the spinal cord and then those messages go up to the brain. We said spinal nerves are mixed they're carrying both sensory messages in and motor messages out, right? So sometimes the brain is having a hard time distinguishing between pain that's happening on the skin and pain that's happening internally. It's almost like the messages as they go through the spinal cord and up the brain stem to the brain, they kind of get confused. And the brain says, okay, this area hurts, but I can't tell you if it's outside or inside. So in some cases, um, we know these already, right? Like appendicitis. Your appendix is, is a little bit lower here, but this is the area around the belly button that hurts if you have appendicitis. Gallbladder is up a little bit higher here, right? So you can have pain that seems like it's external, but it might also be internal. So that's what we call referred visceral pain. You might also have heard about uh, left arm um, aching if you're having a heart attack. It's that same kind of process there where your brain is not really sure where that message is coming from because both of the messages enter on the same section of the spinal nerve. We should review shingles. Shingles is caused by a virus, and that virus can sometimes hang out in specific areas. In this case, it's the posterior root ganglion. So in the neurons that are in the posterior root ganglion, the virus is dormant, but it can be reactivated. So when it's reactivated, it travels through the sensory axons. Remember, posterior is receiving sensory information. It kind of goes backwards. It can go backwards and use the neurons to cause rash and blistering in the skin, burning, tingling. We do have a vaccine that we can use to prevent or reduce the severity of shingles. But this is something that just naturally happens. Some viruses have the ability to become latent and to kind of hang out. And it, once the immune system is suppressed for some other reason, um, you can have a resurgence of this virus and it can start making viral particles and make you sick. This is another section where we're really going to just work kind of on the overview. I want you to know that plexus just means branching. So we're going to have four main um, plexuses that we'll look at, and I'll kind of make the connection between the Ramy and this plexus or branching. So before we look at this cervical branching or plexus, just make sure that we know where we are. So if we have spinal cord, we know that we have posterior root and we have anterior root, and these are going to merge to form spinal nerve. And then we just talked about posterior 
ramus, and then we said we have anterior ramus. So everything here in orange is an anterior ramus. So this is cervical one spinal nerve anterior ramus. And you can see that there's more branching. So everything in yellow is cervical plexus. So off of C1, you're gonna have several branches as they feed different muscles. You're also gonna have overlap or communication. You're gonna have times when this C2 nerve basically has the ability to merge with C3 nerve. This is good because if one of these nerves becomes non-functional, you might have some backup with the other cervical nerve. So there's a lot of overlap. So again, if you see overlapping function, kind of like we saw in the brainstem with the respiratory centers and the cardiac centers, if you see overlapping function, this is good, right? This gives us more flexibility if anything should happen. So all I want you to understand is that after the anterior ramus, you're going to have more branching, and this is the cervical plexus. If you're going into physical therapy, you will have to be able to follow from muscle back through all of these branches, which have names, back to the cervical anterior ramus, back to the spinal cord. So you have to know all of this cervical branching if you're going into physical therapy. Here we have the brachial plexus. We have cervical nerve five, six, seven, and eight, and thoracic one. You can see and follow the branching until we get out to these specific nerves, which are gonna innervate different areas of the body. And you should be able to, after knowing a little bit about bones, kind of make a prediction as to where the ulnar nerve is gonna innervate. Um, axillary, if you remember all the way back in chapter one, when we learned those regions, right, underneath the arm. So brachial plexus, again, just more branching um, that will eventually split into individual nerves that'll innervate specific parts of the body. Next up, we can look at the lumbar plexus. You can see that these are the anterior rami L1 through 5, and that these are going to split into individual nerves, again, that serve uh, specific areas of the body. The last plexus here is the sacral plexus. You can see it's made up of the anterior rami from 4 and 5, lumbar 4 and 5, and from sacral 1 through 4. We're probably very familiar with this sciatic nerve. Right? This is a really large nerve bundle, and it's the position that sometimes causes issues. So you can see the sciatic, all of these sacral are feeding the posterior side of the leg. So they're coming out of the sacral area, they're crossing over this section of the uh, coxal bone, right? And if you remember, there's that little sciatic notch and the sciatic nerve travels all the way down and obviously uh, has deviations as it feeds or innervates specific parts of the body. So it's the location of the sciatic nerve and the fact that it's a pretty large nerve that can cause problems. If you have any sort of um, herniated disc here between L4 and L5, um, it can pinch this nerve and you can see that eventually that becomes the sciatic nerve bundle. So also the location, if you have, remember all the muscles that are here, remember those three gluteal muscles, right? So if you have any sort of gluteal muscle issue, it could be impinging or putting pressure on your sciatic nerve. And most people, and they'll tell you it's pain radiating down the posterior aspect of the leg into the foot. Finally, we get to reflexes. This was the second major uh, function of the spinal cord and spinal nerves. So reflexes require a stimulus. They're rapid or fast. They always happen the same. They're pre-programmed and it's an involuntary response. You have no awareness of the reflex before it happens. And I like to think of this as a survival mechanism. Let's look at the components of a reflex arc. Remember reflexes, no brain motor command. So here's skin. You put your hand on a nail. That's the stimulus. The nail activates your pain receptors. That sensory message travels through your spinal nerve, your posterior root ganglion, your posterior root, and synapses here at your posterior horn. 
you can see that the message is split. So it's showing you part of the message is coming over here to the white matter to send the message up to the brain. But we also have another synapse happening here where it initiates an immediate motor action out the ventral root to the muscle and you lift your hand off of the nail. So the motor message is initiated before the brain receives the signal and has to even think about it. Again, do you want to wait the added time for this uh, message to make it to the brain? Like, oh, my hand is on the nail. What should I do? Okay, maybe I'll initiate muscle contraction. No, we want this immediate, rapid response. Eventually, the brain has to perceive what just happened. And I think I used this example in one of my other uh, PowerPoints, but if you've ever stubbed your toe, you're lifting your toe off the ground and then the pain hits, right? So you want that immediate reflex motor action to kick in and then you can worry about how much pain you're in. You can have reflexes that have multiple synaptic events or just one synaptic event. So you can see here for stretch receptor, if we hit the tendon and it causes the uh, stimulation of the stretch receptor, that message is going to travel to the spinal cord and there's only one synaptic event. We send out an immediate motor uh, message and the leg moves forward. Here, this is polysynaptic, meaning there's more than one. We can see if your hand is over an open flame, the sensory message is coming into the spinal cord, we have an interneuron, and then eventually we have a motor message coming out telling us to contract our biceps brachii and lift our arm. Here's an example of a stretch reflex. So if you're stretching a muscle, it will activate these muscle spindles and that will send a sensory message. It'll synapse in the spinal cord and it'll initiate immediate motor messages um, that result in contraction of the muscle being stretched. So think of stretch as kind of priming the muscle and then your automatic response is for that muscle to contract. Another example is the Golgi tendon reflex. So here we have the Golgi tendon organ that if a tendon is too stretched, that's going to signal a sensory message that goes to the spinal cord. We're going to see synapses that send out motor messages that tell that muscle to relax. So if you're putting too much stretch or strain on a tendon, we're gonna have an immediate response or motor response to tell that muscle to relax, basically to stop you from harming yourself. When we're talking about the lower legs, because we're holding our body weight, right? Remember all of our body weight is going down the femur, or the tibia. We have to do both a withdraw and a crossed extensor reflex. So we saw the withdraw by itself before when we saw the arm and the open flame and we saw the motor message and the arm contracted and we lifted the hand away from the flame. With lower legs, you have to withdraw from the stimulus, right? So you have to lift your leg up, but you also have to counterbalance with the other leg. So in this example, we can see sharp rock, stimulus, right? So sensory message travels through the posterior section, synapses in the spinal cord. The spinal cord is going to do two things, right? Or the synapse in the spinal cord, those neurons are going to cause two different movements, right? One is going to be same side, send a message to the quads to lift your leg off of the sharp, painful object. The other synapse event is, you can see it's crossed over, right? Now it's coming out the ventral root, it's coming down to your opposite leg and telling those muscles to stay extended to balance you. So that's why this is a withdraw on this side, but it is a crossed extensor reflex. So we can use this reflex testing in a clinical setting um, for some diagnoses. So if you have underactive reflex, it could be some sort of damage to the spinal cord, a muscle disease, or maybe there's some issue at the neuromuscular junction itself. So that's going to cover all of chapter 14. Um, I'll see you next video. Bye.